So this is Catherine Lambrecht um, with the Highland Park Historical Society, as I have for many, many years. Uh, oh, you got it. Okay. Um, so I've been with the Highland Park Historical Society since 2005. I've been doing programs for Chicago Foodways Roundtable since 2005. Very interesting dynamic. I didn't realize it just now as I'm talking out loud. So tonight our program is with Nancy Webster, who's been archivist for the Highland Park Historical Society for the last 13 and a half years. She's overseen the, the archive for many years, which has had about $300,000 in grant money to, uh, to facilitate various things like scanning and processing of files. Um, the program tonight uh, is gonna be an expanded version of what she did for the Midwestern History Conference in May. Um, and it's also the basis of an outdoor exhibit in Highland Park, also flora, fauna, and foodways at the uh, Stoopy Log House in Highland Park. Uh, and it's uh, it's open daily, basically sunrise to sundown, because it's just the city, the signs are sitting out there in the park. Um, and in addition, those who would like to, uh, for the first time in a number of years, we are going to do the first Saturday of the month from 10 o'clock to noon. Okay, we will allow people to make reservations, but we're going to try to start again being regularly out there representing the, um, the cabin. Nancy and I will be out there on Saturday. And uh, you wanna come watch us on our training wheels mission? You're welcome, because that's really what it's going to be like. It's going to be like training wheels, but we'll get through it. So, Nancy, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And um, thank you to the Highland Park Community Foundation for their funding that funded parts of this program. I also want to thank Jeff Stern for his editing comments and Catherine Lambrecht for her graphic help. And various people that have helped with this collections over the years, including a young woman named Christina who worked with the Chicago Botanic Gardens to identify, um, and myself, many of these plants which had no labels on it. They were all captured in the early 20th century. So writing social media entries for these early 20th century images over the last few years, um, I started to notice in addition to medicine uses and other early uses that um, these were also many natural food sources. So if you look at Blue Verven, um, which we think of as something for tea, also a food source. Um, and the seeds are used can be made something like flour and that's a food source that people gathered at one time. All of these plants that we're talking about um, grow in this area naturally or brought here by settlers. Of course, this area along the lake was carved out by glaciation and was occupied by woodland natives and later Potawatomi tribes and ceded to the United States in 1833. And that's where our part of the story will begin with the 19th century and European and American settlers who are gathering here and also a new medium called photography. And of course, people took pictures of themselves eating. I, I don't think that they took pictures of their food like you see now on social media, but here's um, some people gathering to eat for an engagement celebration by Oscar Brand, who had a photography studio, studio in town, left us a great photographic documentation, a basket of fruit by Chaplain George Rice, a friend of Orson Brand, who also um, was his chaplain at Port Sheridan, but hung out and lived in Highland Park with Orson. And here's, I'm not, we don't even know what rice looked like. That's Orson with his brand back to the camera and taking pictures of themselves, eating and drinking and doing human things. And again, Orson, one of the earliest self-portraits or selfies we have from Highland Park, he took pictures of himself drinking and eating and with family and bikes. But now to the, the meat of the program. Most of the pictures here were taken by Jesse Lo Smith or if not, they're taken by E.E. E. Parat. Jesse Lo Smith is very well known in Highland Park. He taught school and served as superintendent of Highland Park Illinois Grammar Schools from 1902 until his death in 1934. In addition to progressively innovating conservation and other naturalist movements, 
he formed the first Highland Park Historical Society. His papers from that first effort have been made available to researchers, including studies and manuscripts on skunk cabbage, milkweed. He even tried to replicate the unique heat producing qualities of this early blooming plant. These slides are all in black and white. In many cases, Smith's slides were covered by um, were colored by Grace Nichols, who's nationally known outstanding colorist in Chicago. Um, her work can be found in diverse institutions outside of ours, like the Massachusetts Historical Society, architecture collections. Photograph photographers from around the world transferred their work to Nichol because she could do this great miniature coloring. In this case, this photo you're looking at is not by um, Grace, it's by another woman who was very famous in Chicago. And otherwise, her name is Charlotte Pinkerton. And she was born to missionaries in South Africa. She spent her earliest years in Wisconsin. As a young woman at the beginning of the 20th century, Pinkerton attended the Art Institute and worked as a lantern slide colorist. She worked in California and founded the Santa Cruz Art League after 1914 and her marriage. Her work can be found in the Autry Museum of the American West, Yale University, other collections, including ours. The photo was taken by a friend of Jesse Lowe Smith. This friend was called E.E. E. Peratt, Elmo Peratt, and they were gonna write a book together about flora and fauna of the area. I don't, we never, we have never seen it. We don't know there's a complete manuscript, an entry level manuscript, but they were beginning to take photographs and develop a concept of local North Shore flora and fauna. Peratt was not a photographer, like he was amateur, like Smith. He came to Highland Park to work on the Northwest Railway. And by the time he was retired, he was a traveling station auditor. And the, we know these are photos that are by him because they're marked photographed by Parat and colored by Pinkerton. There might be others, but I think they did mark most of them. And one of the most striking images is this of Indian rice, Native American rice that grew naturally throughout this area. And it, it grows in sloths and marshes and it was a native food source, a standard native food source. It still grows here and it's key to the Native American diet in this area. It can be made in a multiple uses and ways. It can be made on a fire. It can be made in an instant pot, actually, too. I found some recipes. Um, and it's basically a standard pot or potage that you put in um, rice and corn and fish or meat, and it stews all day. And it was a standard food source. It doesn't grow as, as much as it not not. Um, Unsurprisingly, however, you can buy it and it's quite expensive. In fact, there's a 1956 or 57 McLean's article that says, calls it the gourmet weed, the gourmet rice, because it became very popular. Of course, corn has been grown here for as, as long as humans have been cultivating food. And there's gonna be a mixture of foods that we discuss, or, or I mentioned that were grown here naturally and gathered that were cultivated by Native American tribes or were brought here by Europeans when they settled. A recent book called Dinner in Rome, A History of World in One Meal by the Norwegian um, chef and writer, Andreas Vistad says um, that we sought examples. It isn't correct to say that food is a passing thing, present and ephemeral while marble and cobblestones are permanent, the only things with the ability to tell stories about the past, I'm convinced that history is also present, maybe even to a greater degree in the food we eat. And that's, you know, in many ways, that's true. And culinary history has become recognized in a, in a more, it's been more inclusive now in the history canon. And corn dodgers are something that you could make from corn. And we know that Lincoln quite liked them. And we know they were very popular use and mentioned frequently in 18th and 19th century literature. Here's a recipe from Illinois. And here's a picture of what they might've looked like from vintage vittles. Another natural food growing source in this area are June berries. And June berries grow near the ravines. They're an understory tree. And they were one of the major um, ingredients in, I think that's a chat there. I'm going to answer it um, if it's a question. Is Indian rice essentially the same thing we call wild rice? No, it's related, but it's not the same. 
Now, probably the first energy bar that we know of that was created and invented was by Native Americans. I'm sure there were some in other continents as well. It's called pemmican, and it's basically an energy bar made with dried meat strips, fat or lard, and dried fruit, especially the June berries, which they would, of course, harvest off the trees. Is there's many recipes and they vary all the, the many of these recipes are very are much simpler than the recipes you might find in a cookbook today. They're passed down word of mouth and they're simpler. You put you know, just a little bit of meat, a little bit of fat, a little dry fruit, dry, and they let them out to dry. They hang them. This picture is by Matthew Barry, Brady um, of Native Americans creating pemmican and hanging it to preserve for the year coming time. Another natural food for growing food source, which grows naturally in this area, is the pawpaw. Of course, we have pawpaw Michigan, we have pawpaw Illinois, we have pawpaw Indiana, because these fruits grow naturally and were eaten like apples off the tree. So, but they were never really cultivated. You know, for whatever reason, cultivations evolve. And, um, but they were, they are mentioned, they were used. And there's a couple sources that call pawpaws the, you know, the, the hidden treasure, the fruit, the best known, most secret American fruit. And there's several books about it currently, they're listed in the bibliography, that talk about how pawpaw is such a good food source and grows here and encouraging people to eat them. I've never had one. I take his word for it. But here's a, a, a picture of pawpaw that Jesse Le Smith took. He actually took this in Indiana. Um, in a southwestern um, farm where one of his teachers lived and was teaching it. This is the title of the book, is The Wonderful Wild Pawpaw, America's Largely Least Known Fruit. So we found some recipes that are quite popularly passed around for things like pawpaw pudding, um, and they say to peel pawpaws, mash them through a sieve. Again, these recipes are, um, you know, much simpler than we have. Add one half cup of pulp, milk, sugar, yelks. We checked this out in the 1928, 1918 Webster Dictionary, and yelks was the preferred spelling, and yolks was considered incorrect. However, this add a little bit of salt, a little bit of vanilla, beat, set over the stove, add a meringue. And this is from the Journal of Agricultural Cookbook, 1894. There's another question, so I'm going to take that just in case it's about this actual fruit. So Beth says the flavor and texture are similar to cherimoya. That I did not know. Wild plum, which is a cousin, it's actually a rose of plum, was growing here naturally. Um, it's actually cited in reports back to the king of France that they have found there's just growing everywhere and they're beautiful. And they get the, and of course, not surprisingly, they were cultivated, picked, and dried and to make prunes. And we also have the quintessential recipe for Christmas plum pudding that's so fun. And this, again, is an early American recipe from writers. All the citations are at the end of the presentation. This, was, this is another picture that was taken in Indiana by Jocelyn Smith, but sassafras grows here as well. And this was taken in Southwest Indiana and grows naturally in Highland Park and in um, the ravines here. And sassafras, of course, is the main ingredient in root beer. Theoretically, um, as is Prairie Dock is involved too. Here's two beautiful pictures of Prairie Dock. Um, you can see them in our gardens and Stupy Gardens. And here you have, um, I've, there's a book of recipes called Dr. Chase's Recipes, um, 600 Practical Recipes. And he writes a recipe for root beer and you use hops and burdock, yellow dock, sarsaparilla, dandelion, and spikenard roots, almost all of which we have photos of in the collection, how to boil them, and guess the sweetness and how to store them with a the cloth. Dr. Chase um, lived in Ann Arbor. He was attending medical school. He didn't graduate. Um, he kind of was, you know, a self-taught doctor. He eventually did get a medical degree from another university after he got to Michigan. But um, so he was a very popular book. There's multiple editions. And it's a book of household hints and recipes like this, how to make somebody like root beer. He notes that it's a nice way to take alternatives without taking medicine. I think this was also distilled into a kind of um, alcoholic brew on a certain level as well. And I, I probably talk is in the middle there because 
it's in addition to an ingredient like and being cooked as draw greens and other things, it is a natural chewing gum. Um, Yankton Bag of the Dakota Tribe writer Violinus Zikala Saw recalls the joy of the summer treat in multiple short stories. If you're not familiar with her, there's a picture of her. And it's always good to have a picture of a girl with her violin. If you know me, you understand that. Um, and she was a polymath who um, wrote about being the trauma of being removed from her tribe and raised in a Western school. But she was also a musician. And some of her music's being rediscovered now. She combined Western and Native American musical traditions to write operas and other pieces. And of course, settlers discovered as well that um, this was this natural fun gum. And the quoting here from a pioneer from Indiana, no children chew purer or nicer gum than the pioneer children of the prairies gathered in abundance from the polar plant. It's a polar plant. If you ever see it leans, it tells us the way. It costs no pennies and it could be had fresh every day in midsummer. And again, this is not, these are not cultivated items. Some of the fruits became cultivated later. They didn't catch on, pawpaw, juneberry. Um, same as adder, wild adder's tongue, not the snake. The food grows naturally and it can be eaten as a salad or vegetable. It's also kind of we having been brought back kind of vogue, you see recipes and foragers discussions of that. Um, one thing, and these recipes vary, put a little this, a little that, but one thing you see for the adder's tongue, blanch, never boil, and it kind of tastes like spinach or kind of tastes like asparagus. Um, and you can see the flowers, they're very distinctive flowers of the adder's tongue. Sorrel, wild sorrel is a, an excellent food source. It's used throughout the world. Um, by Native Americans and by Europeans. The Native Americans have many uses. You find many recipes for souk in diaries in early in the 19th century to say, you know, wash a handful. Again, the, the kind of how do you make something? You wash a handful. You add some chevron and lettuce, chop very fine. Let's stew, season to taste. And it's there's talks where things are preserved. You can't go to the grocery store and buy. So it says winter jars, chopped, pounded and seasoned, covered closely. So these instructions are passed on in books and magazines. And while so it's supposed to have like a lemon tangy taste, French um, cuisine uses it a lot, kind of like a sauce or a side hooks of a tangy lemon taste. And now we're coming to cultivated um, foods in this country. The wild cabbage was brought to this country by a Frenchman, um, and it was first planted in Quebec and was probably the first cultivated plant from Europe in this country because it was a major food source, of course, in Europe. And here um, you see the cabbage and um, popular, of course, because it was brought and we find recipes. And I also want to bring some other pictures here. So the beet and the carrot were also brought to this country, the beets, the carrots by the Dutch. There's been a lot of discussion lately about who, in fact, um, did the Dutch make the carrots orange because they are the Dutch and because they um, want to be orange. We don't know that. It, it's true, but what we do know for sure, it is the Dutch who brought the carrot to this country. It was Europeans and we're not sure that brought the beet that all have continued to be sources of food and cultivated and raised and used in recipes. And throughout the 19th century, we find many recipes using these ingredients. I have a picture, this is again, this is a picture by, um, by Parnat Harat and colored by Pinkerton of peppergrass going naturally on what they called the Waukegan Flats, the beaches and the north of Illinois. This is used as a natural flavoring. And you see many recipes in the 19th century touting, you know, the health is, this is from a wife of a homeopathic physician with basic recipes instructions. And it's kind of like, so someone who's not a cook like myself cooks too. You steep the fowl, you take it out, you wipe it, you boil it, you mince the carrots. It tells you, and here's the yolk spelled with a more recent version and cook it. And you can see there's not many ingredients in it, but you can see they're all readily available that they're either cultivated by Europeans or naturally here, us bird, of course. Another recipe using the same, I has with the peppergrass that you see is with turnips and beets. Of course, these recipes were developed by European settlers 
but it also includes sorrel seeds and turnips and beets. So a mixture of natural going and cultivated items to create a soup. And you see recipes, many recipes, because there's a little bit of pork in here, but they're not necessarily beet, beet based. I have another question. So I'm just gonna, I'm, I'm not sure if there's a question, but it says very different than barret and carrot. I grow with stems coming from the top of the root. I've never grown either. Um, so I, you might have to comment more comment on that later when we discuss this. Of course, you know, you have the, the three sisters, you do the corn, the squash, and the beans, but you have also grains which are cultivated and raised. And this picture is of Highland Park um, to create best. I have another comment. We'll answer that just in case it's pertinent. Beet. Okay. Um, I hate beets. So, um, and so I like kind of a story. So I hate beets so much. My mother used to send me down to the basement to get beets to cook for dinner. I would hide them like around. It's not very nice, but not very good, but character, but around the house. And when my parents moved well after I was gone out of the house, um, grown up and professional, they were cleaning out the house and they found a couple cans of beets, like back in like nooks and crannies in the basement. Sure. I really, really hated that much. So shorty, this is a standard recipe. You see it frequently in recipes. You see it frequently in literature. Again, a recipe from Chase, widely sold, widely appreciated to how to make buckkeek with sour milk, soda salertis, which is baking soda. If you've read Laura Ingalls Wilder's books, she refers to it simply as salertis. Dissolved in milk, probably a different consistency than you would purchase today in the grocery store. If the milk is very sour, you must use salertis in proportion. A little sate, I think that's salt, mix up dough, buckwheat flour for griddle cakes. Then he goes on to talk about different flours, which we know buckwheat, right? Many flours, nice with meat, how do you do it? No shortening, no need of setting your dish of batter overnight for a drunken husband to set his foot in. There's frequent recipes, references to alcoholism um, in many recipes by both men and women, kind of talking about what do you do? How do you deal with a drunken husband? How do you deal with a hangover? So this is interesting information you can find in many recipes. We're going to end with um, another food that is really beloved by foragers. And um, it's called Spring Beauties. They actually grow naturally in Highland Park. I've seen them. They're called Miscodeed in Ojibwa. And these, the corms of the fairy spud have been described variously as tasting like chestnuts or potatoes when boiled or peeled. Um, they don't, those things don't say similar to my mind, but the corms do not require peeling. 19th century hostesses, allegedly including First Lady Mary Lincoln, favored spring beauties for lunch and plate garnishes. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow cites the spring by the royal in his epic poem, The Song of Hiawatha. And all little children in Michigan learn this poem. And it says, saw the earliest flower of springtime, saw the beauty of the springtime, saw the miscodeed in blossom. And this again is another photo by Parade and colored by Pinkerton. Thank you. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Can I interject something very little related to this collection, these glass slides? Uh, when I was like 11 or 12 years old, um, I was asked to document the slides. And I was willing, except they expected me to go to the high school. I didn't have any older brothers or sisters. The whole thing just freaked me out, so I didn't. So it was kind of fun to come back around to this collection once more. And didn't this, isn't this owned by the park district, the, these slides? No, when the collection was found um, in a closet, according to the correspondence in our, in our records from Elm Place School in, 19, in the, the 90s and transferred to the Historical Society, um, the bulk of them are glass slides by Smith. What was your exact question? I'm sorry, Kathy. Um, I, it wasn't exact. Well, maybe it was a question. It was because I know Mr. Torgerson was involved. That was the um, teacher at the, the science teacher. school. Right. And he's a photographer as well. 
He was oh. a photographer and he came, um, t- he, he and apparently a janitor at various times when they were almost going to get thrown out would these glass slides and more than a thousand have survived and we've cataloged them. They're online, available online. They've been digitized. We found more and more information about them. Various people saved them when they got moved from closet to closet. Um, and eventually in the 1990s, they were transferred to the Highland Park Historical Society. And Torgerson was, Sir Torgerson was one of those people involved in that. And a few of the slides, a small number, and it's indicated in the catalog records, were kept and selected by the park district. And I do not believe I used any of the park district images in this um, presentation. These are all that were glass slides that were transferred to the Highland Park Historical Society. That, that, that's fine. And I know, sorry everybody in case you're interested, but I know we bought a collection of glass slides a few years ago that we found in a, uh, it, it was going to be sold at a house sale. Now, were that anything related to this Jesse Lowe Smith or just the No, those have been to seem to be either by Orson Brand or his buddy, George Rice. Um, they did not seem to travel in the same circles. Um, oh. Well, no, I mean, not, that's not good or bad. It's just that, you know, I, could, I can see from pictures and notes and articles that um, Orson Brand and the chaplain hung out together. They went, their families did things together. Rice shopped at his shop. I don't see references in Smith's diary to a friendship with either of these people or interactions with them. Um, he talks about his friendship with the Parats and various other people, and he describes taking the pictures, which helped us date and gave us a lot of information about them. But it, you know, those four people, we have other photographers in town, well, you provide the bulk of our photographic documentation of Highland Park. And it is very rich and very good because these, instead of intimate photograph photographers coming through, we had both these very serious amateur and professional photographers in town. Someone had their hand raised. Um, yeah, yeah, that's Carrie. Carrie, why don't you? I'm going to ask you to unmute. Why don't you? Uh... I, yeah, I, I understand about not liking beets. I, I can beets. I, I don't like even maybe one slice on, on a salad, but beyond that, I hate them too. But I absolutely love fresh beet greens, lightly steamed. They're my favorite cooked green. You might try that sometime. Also, even if you look at the grocery store, besides what I grow up, you look at the grocery store when they have beets or carrots with, with, the, with the tops on them. All the, all the, all the, there's, there's the root, and then all these come from one spot at the top of the root. Whereas the pictures you had had, had a vertical stem with leaves coming off the side. I'm wondering if that's a different European version of those, of those plants, and can we get that anywhere? You know, I think it varies how we cultivate things. Um, what I did learn working on this with these um, slides and with Jessica Smith notes and other research is there's different varieties we brought over, and that's why I'm not specific about who brought started cultivating beets in this country, because probably multiple groups were doing it at the time and with slightly different variations. So um, it probably varies and it's probably evolved quite a lot since the 18th and 19th centuries. Do you want me to show some of the, um, the finished puzzle pieces as if people came to visit the garden? Sure. Okay, you gotta need unshare, please. Okay. This is this is a power, this is a uh, publisher program. You from your armchair. You, you don't have to go to Highland Park to see it. No, you don't. Of course, we'd be happy to see you and you can watch the amateur show. <laughs> And there's a lot of information here that I use, not, it's not the complete exhibits that I use talking about the quote, the book Dinner in Rome, which just came out last year, is very interesting and, and legitimizes culinary history and discusses in depth how food documentation documents our world and our lives. Okay, and there's the corn dodgers. And the, the picture here is taken by, uh, am I on? Uh, am I muted or am I not? I know. You're not muted. Uh, by Henry, by Henry, Henry Ehrenberg, uh, whom we have a number of images from uh, in our collection. Uh, thousands. His wife, thousands. thousands. And right. He, a large number are digitized and online on both our website and on the Digital Library of America. Right. And, and, and it was thankfully, and, and he was present like to document the moving of the Stoopy Cabin years ago. Right. 
Mm -hmm. um, okay, and here's the uh, the Judeberry pemmican. And the pawpaw. I'm, I'm going to put these up on our website. I haven't done it yet. I keep talking about it. But so here's the pawpaw tree with the pawpaw pudding. Um, and I have a friend in Pawpaw, Illinois. So I have to go visit her and get some. Uh, the wild plum prunes. Yes. Oh, wild plum recipe for prunes. Got it. Um, Maybe camp you want to maybe comment about the logo of the uh, historical society, the Stupid Cabin from 1847. So, so that was a um, local artisan. A local artist named Leo Grotti, who lived almost 100 years, um, son of Italian immigrants, served for decades, Rivenia Post deliverer, uh, was also an artist and amateur historian, and he drew various pictures and logos for the Highland Park Historical Society, all our buildings. And there's multiple iterations, and this iterations in his papers that his partner gave to us when he passed away, and is of the Stupid Cabin, and he drew that shortly after it was moved to the spot between Highland, between the city hall and the library. And there's actually several variations of that image, but the one that I favor is the one with the cooking pot, um, which a few years ago that was roughly the location that we were cooking some food. It was. And Carrie noted that some web websites say Juneberry is also called Serviceberry. And I did find that. I found frequently that there were multiple names in multiple languages for um, recipes. And we just tried to use the most frequently used one or known one. So for this particular piece for the Prairie Dock, this natural chewing gum, I have a friend in Yankton, South Dakota. And I called her up to ask her about this violinist and how to refer to this um, tribe. In fact, she, this is exactly how she told us the Yankton band of the, of the Dakota tribe, writer and violinist. But she knew immediately who I was talking about. I was completely unaware, which is just, uh, oh, okay. She, we'll, we'll get back on the pawpaw tree. Um, anyway, uh, I just want to point that out because I knew nothing and I went to check because we had another description and she helped us identify what would be correct from a South Dakota point of view. Um, sassafras and root beer. Um, well, sassafras. Um, okay. Yep, sorrel. Somebody's promised me some sorrel soup this summer. I'm looking forward to it. I presume it has kind of a sourish taste. And you'll notice some of these photos are taken in meadows in the natural state. Others are Wen Smith, and it's Larger Smith who did the collected these specimens and took these slides and the specimen to the artists downtown, whether it be Nichols or other people that are not documented, to color them and make it as close and accurate as possible. And then here is the cabbage. Cabbage, you know, Jacques Cartier. Uh, I know there's a comment here, and, and Jean, that's great that you have saplings. I was given. Uh, pawpaw seeds a few years ago because they have to like overwinter they have to chill before you can and here's what I learned there are male trees and female trees they're not necessarily and they have to be in somewhat close proximity um, if you know more about that that would be useful because to have a pawpaw and not have the right uh, combination present it, it could be I think a frustrating moment um, I only, it, it, it's something I learned. That's why I never bothered to, to grow them because I didn't want a whole bunch of males or a whole bunch of females. And here's the carrots. Wow, what an effort to hand so, color. Yeah, Jesse Lowe Smith, um, that is Elm Place School. And he grew these American plants to demonstrate. I don't know they talk about it the way we talk about it, about something being brought to this country, but talks about a major foodstuff something that's grown. He discusses, you know, teaching about these foods and then they're growing them by the children and involving the children in the cultivation. It's kind of a very progressive education theme. Was he present at El Place when they put in the observatory? Yes, he took pictures it? of it. There's pictures online oh, as well. Fantastic. Yeah. Uh, here's the adder's tongue. So if you came and saw the exhibit, this is, you know, what you would see. 
Um, I guess that's it. Um, yeah, Gene, I'm, I'm interested in the pawpaw too. I would be planted by the stupid cabin. Maybe we'll have to figure that out. But maybe we can sort of plant a few kind of nearby. Um, any other questions, people? Whee! If you want to unmute to discuss this, just put up your yellow, put up your hand or something. Ooh, there's somebody with me. Oh, that's Gene. Okay. Anything else? We've left them speechless. <laughs> okay, well then, I guess we'll call, unless somebody has a question real quick, I guess we will, oh, somebody has a new message. Oh, okay. Um, anything else? Nancy, this was fun, or at least, you know, it's kind of nice to use the archives in this commingling with food ways and such. You know, because I think you, you this this whole thing got going because you started to find references in the archives. Just brief it was comments. just doing social media entries about you know for Friday flowers and this is in the collection, and I would try to you know and I there's a lot of recipes I didn't include too. I tried to things the most frequent ones and use ones and that were related to this area. I would find comments about well this is this part was used for that this is part used for that and then I started you know, going through herb books and 21st century forager books and kind of putting all the pieces together. Carrie has a question again. He does. Well, let's go. All right. And no? oh, shoot, shoot, shoot. No, no, I accidentally, no, I'll catch him. I'll find you, Carrie. I know where you are. He's up at, oh, he's, okay. Yeah, okay. Fast to unmute. Go ahead. Um, this, this will be on YouTube or something, right? There are a lot of names of plants that I didn't write down. I might be interested in trying to grow myself. Right. So I put the link to the presentation in um, the, the, the chat. And okay. all, all the, the citations are at the bottom um, for everything that's used in the presentation. And the links click on to both the images in our catalogs and whatever's related to this. So there's like dozens of links within the collect in, in the presentation and the names and the sources are all listed there. And then the what you said the wild rice the reference is not the same thing as or the Indian rice the reference is not the same as the wild rice that we buy at the store which no. reportedly Indian rice from Minnesota or something I thought. So if they're different, how do you uh, is there's there what, different variations. The picture of this one um, I'm gonna share my screen again and show you. I mean, it looked, it looked like the wild rice you buy from what I could see on a tiny It street. does? Okay, I, I don't know that I'm knowledgeable enough about rice to um, comment on really? that, but when I was researching, I, I saw comparisons between the Zinnia aquatica that grows, that or grew, it doesn't grow in like yeah. the Upper Peninsula yeah. and this area. I did not, um, and I saw it saying it's not this, and they differentiated between different rices, but I expect it's really quite similar. I mean, the wild rice that we buy at the store is, is I think, grown, grown by Indians in Minnesota or something. It looks like it's black, which um, I don't know what it looks like as when it's growing. I right? looked up the prices because when I first researched it, and it goes for about $40 a pound. That's actually, the see, price of wild rice goes. Aquatica. <laughs> um, so I think maybe that specific breed, I don't, um, is a little more expensive. I mean, that, that is kind of the price that you generally find for wild, what we call wild rice in the grocery okay. store. I and have a feeling you know much more about this than I do. If you come around on the web, I think you can find like three pounds for $40 or something, but. but um, that, that, it's quite expensive. It's more like wheat than rice, and it's totally not like rice. I like did white. see that comment in some of the things I read that, you know, saying it's, it's a grass. Oh, yeah. So it's probably it, it maybe a different, a different, a slight variation, but it sounds like it's the same thing that I, I am currently eating and buying myself. So, and you know, I, on the Tequilmon River in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, um, you can see it growing along the banks um, throughout the river and other rivers as well, naturally. And the, the Native Americans, at least in that area, still have the right to harvest it for food stores. So, Ms. Lasky has some questions. 
Well, I put my questions in the box, but I think I'll be okay. Um, one question. I, go okay. ahead. Um, one question I was wondering is, is there a way to get the Latin names and a place where we could get seeds to grow some of these items in our yards? For example, to do a habitat. Yeah. So um, the seeds, I don't, I saw various resources for seeds when I was researching this. I don't know that um, you would find anything different than I could. I'd be happy to um, add the Latin names and send them out in an email or send them to you. Um, we, we, that sounds good. I can do that. Yeah. Thank because you. I we made that decision because there were so many different names and the Latin name and the Southern name and different tribes of different names. We just used the most frequently vernacular name that we were finding for most part. Okay, and then was there a website that you found with the actual, um, I know you've had so many questions about the rice. No, I love the questions. Um, is there a website that has um, access to the actual wild rice, not the cultivated form that it, we could purchase close by? There was a co-op in Minnesota that I found. Okay. Um, and again, I just found it by doing a Google search. I can't vouch for their quality. Um, and I believe... Um, it was very much something that was gathered rather than cultivated, at least in Michigan. Um, okay. And, and, and I think some tribes have the permission to go and do hand cultivation and, you know, hand, collecting it by hand. It is, it is true. And it's not something that is like generally allowed by the general population, but the tribes mm -hmm. may. Okay. And and that, this was so good. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for coming it's really it's it's been such a um when you're an archivist you know you, you learn you might have a subject um especially when you start a job but then you come in and you're working with different collections for different reasons and you kind of get to dig into those subjects um whether it's flora and fauna or photography in this case food and you just learn a whole lot more and just sometimes it's not as in-depth as you'd like but it, it's very interesting and it helps you understand kind of the world. And that's, I, I do agree with um, Vistad that it, what people ate and what they eat are, is very descriptive and telling about human history. Mm -hmm. Well, I think you. we're good. Oh, thank you, Jeffrey. In the, in the presentation, I did include some links. Um, to some very various Native American sites that had different recipes. Um, and I found a wide variety of recipes, but I just found the one thing, fish, corn, and rice kind of mixed together in a pot or fish, meat, less less meat, but because of Great Lakes, of course, um, just kind of mixed together in a pot. Um, and the Wisconsin Historical Society has a 19th century recipe that essentially says that as well. And that's also listed. Oh, I'm so glad to have a prairie doc. Prairie duck's really so very pretty. It's in front of our stupid cabin as well. It's tall and it's not quite blooming yet in our area, but um, it is very pretty and practical. Who knew? And if you have a chance to read Zatala Zhu, um, she, she writes great short stories and I'm hoping to hear her music again because it was kind of lost for a while. And you have the heart of a violinist being a violinist. I was like debating because there's different pictures of her available at the Smithsonian and some other places. And there's a picture of her Native American dress. There's pictures of her dressed up, but I, I had to use the violin, so. Well, okay. You and I will hang out together on uh, Saturday morning from 10 to noon. Anybody wants to drop by, you're welcome. <laughs> it should be an interesting day, huh? Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you, Nancy. And uh, we'll be seeing you soon. And you don't have to come. Like I said, this exhibit, it's from sunrise to sundown. It's across from the Central Highland Park train station. Okie doke. Yep. Yeah. Good night, everybody. Good night.